I'm not preaching this morning. I'm going to just answer some questions. We have a lot of questions, you know, like I said two weeks ago, that we're supposed to answer. So I'll be answering some of those questions. But I just want to show you something that I... First Samuel chapter 8. I read from, from verse 10. First Samuel chapter 8 from verse 10. We are going to verse 20. So we read, we read from... So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to who? The people who asked him for a king. At this point... Israel said to God, sorry, they said to Samuel that they don't want a prophet leading. In other words, they said they don't want God leading through the prophet again. We want to be like the other nations of the world. We want a leader. We want a president. We want a king that we can see. So God, Samuel took the matter to God. And Samuel was so angry and vexed that God said, it's not you that they have rejected. It is me. Because I'm actually the one leading through you. So God said, don't worry. Give them what they want. So from that day, God disconnected himself from making ultimate decision as a, as a God for the people. As at that time, he was God who was leading. It was called theocracy. Even though someone was the judge, they called them judges. So they said here that we want Samuel, we want the king. So God now told Samuel, go and tell the people. So God, God told Samuel all these words of the people um, who asked him for a king. Verse 11. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariot. Talking about his, what do you call that? People who run before the chariot. What do you call it in Nigeria? Current experience. Convoy. Thank you. <laughs> you see where convoy started from? So it depends on your, the level of your sophistication. Some people will have 1,000 one cars in convoy. See, it's here. It's in the, we are reading the Bible. Am I correct? Verse 12. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariot. As I'm reading scripture, please try to apply, expand your mind and try to apply to things that's happening in leadership and in government. Verse 13. He will make your daughters to be perfumers, cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your field, your vineyard and your olive groves and give them to his servant. You know what they call this? Allocation. They can just come and take a particular land and they share it. It's here in the Bible. And they are doing it. <laughs> Verse 15. He will take a tent of your grain and your vineyard and give it to his officers and servant. What is the tent? Tax. Before now, they were not paying taxes. Verse 16, and he will take your male servants and your female servants and your finest young men and, and your donkeys and put them to his work. Talking about the military or the civil service. Verse 17, he will take a tent of your sheep, it will be, and you will be his servants. Verse 18, and you will cry out, verse 18, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. And the Lord will not Oh my God. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no. But we have a king over us. We don't care. Verse 20. That we also may be like all the nations. And that all that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battle. Before then, God has been the one fighting for them. They said, no. God, don't fight for us again. We will fight for ourselves. When we people go and do election, what they're saying is that we chose you. Am I correct? Can God subvert the will of people who choose something? Who chose something? Somebody tell me. Will God subvert the will of the people? 
He has never done it. He will not break his principles. When you choose a leader, God will not override your choosing. I hope somebody is listening. The only time where God can be influenced is when you pray before you choose. You know the funny thing? The Holy Spirit said to me, he said, do you know that during this election, there were Christians, my own children, who rigged the election for their favorite candidate? And I'm not talking of any particular party. Christians, children of God, who compromised because of a candidate. <laughs> you know what that means? We are saying that the kingdom of this world is better than the kingdom of God. This one is the one we have subscribed to. This one is the one that we want. So many things that the Holy Spirit told me during this election. Oh my God. It is foolishness for Christians to be fighting themselves because of one candidate. Some people have fought their friends. Some people have fought their sisters and their brothers. <laughs> because of politician. Because of one party. Are you okay? And I was having a conversation with you on Sunday. I said, is it possible that when we pray, God will hear us after we have chosen a candidate? Is it possible that Lord help us? Oh, Bawa, oh, this is one we chose. Will God help us? See, I'm not, I don't have answers. I'm asking you questions, and I think it's important that you ask yourself these questions. This is how we become Christians and mature in the knowledge of God. We just finished one government now, and we've been praying. Did God change anything? Did God change anything? <laughs> so, Uche now asked me, say, ah, but God said we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Hey, money, yes, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs> peace of Jerusalem. When you choose a leader, you can, now come, you can now come back to God and say, Lord, change what I chose. He gave us a will and will not override the will. Be careful how you choose. That's where the answer to the prayer is. Is somebody listening to me? So don't be emotional about it. Don't be too attached. What is important is, <laughs> Lord, we are in it. My own, let me be different. Because Bible talked about um, Sodom and Gomorrah and how the way and the life of the people so frustrated Lot. That's, that's how critical it is. Until God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he only, by mercy and grace, removed Lot. There are so many things I don't want to say from this movie that the Holy Spirit told me. They are, they are dummy. And God is so very concerned about his own children. If you ask arm robbers to pick a leader in a community, and the commissioner of police is one of the leaders, would they pick commissioner of police? Who would they pick? <laughs> they will pick arm robber like them. They will never pick a righteous man that they know will give them a problem. That's the way it works. So be careful how you believe prophecies. And then you put all your energy in prophecy, and then prophecy doesn't get wrong. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't come to pass. And somebody says, I will not go to church again. <laughs> and I saw some videos. Let's say, I will not go to church again. And I will not talk to God again. I say, on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there will be a lot of people who prayed and fasted and did a lot and their prophecy did not come, their candidate did not win, and they are mad with God. 
It's not, it's not proper. Are you listening to me? Please, uh -huh. Please. deliver yourself from that. The, the, the politics has entered into the church. So entered into the church. And I have, a, I have a problem with the word politics because I don't always like it. Politics is just struggle for power. And it's in the Bible. Remember James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who went and hired their mom to come and talk to Jesus so that he will give them top position in heaven. That's lobbying. That's politics. Then she came to Jesus. Master Jesus, <laughs> we know God is doing miracles and powerful in your ministry. Thank you for your sons that you are using. Right before the disciples. By the time she was through with her request, she had compromised the camp. All the other apostles were angry. Jesus said, that decision is not mine. And that's where I learned the principle. Even if I'm the head of anything, I don't give the impression that the box stop on my table. There's someone I'm still reporting to. That's how I learned my principles. Some, someone asked me, what are my secrets? Said I have a lot of secrets that I, that, that I, when I was preaching during the series, I will tell you some of them. So that's how it works. Um, well, this is a struggle for power. And people will do anything to get the power. Unfortunately, they may not know what to do with the power. Okay? Uh, it is well with you. Amen. I said it is well with you. Amen. Okay, so let me answer some of these questions. The time is going. So someone says, you suggested that early introduction to God builds better knowledge and relationship with God. How does that impact some of us who are just starting to know God now? And how does that affect our children as well? You know, I said that one of the things that made it we talked about apostolic secrets. I'm saying one of the things that made it very powerful for some of the, you know, um, these people of hold to work with God deeply. And I used Enoch and David as an example. And I said it's their early knowledge, you know, introduction of God. So I will try to answer because I prepared the answer in such a way as to teach. <laughs> and so it's not just like you just give answers. Okay, so for everyone connecting with us online, so it's a like an interactive discussion session. Now, I will take comments from the house. If you have a comment, if you have a question as we go along, or you have anything you want to add based on the things you know, that I will say. So um, you suggested that early introduction to God builds better knowledge and relationship with God. How does that impact some of us who are just getting to know God um, now? And how does that affect our children? Um, so as I wrote here, it doesn't matter when you start. Okay? Uh, that's not God's problem. What is important is how convinced, how committed, and how dedicated you are now in your infant faith. Is that okay? How intentional you are about your spiritual journey is key. All of us know that the people who win the Olympic gold, they didn't start two years before. They didn't start one year before. I'm seeing videos of babies who are super powerful. I saw a video of a guy who was playing bass guitar. A boy. What he was playing was in another realm. A baby boy. That, that boy cannot be more than seven or eight. Okay, maybe not a baby. You know, seven, eight. And when I saw what he was playing with the bass guitar, there's a tune, a very popular tune that he played. I stumbled on it because I was trying to um, understand the different instrument in a particular sound. Okay, so I'm interested in music. I love music a lot. And, and I stumbled on this guy's short video. And if you see what he was playing, I said, in 10 years, in 15 years, if this guy is consistent, you, it will be far, 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 far. That's how they win Olympics. Go and check the nations of the world. That's how they win the Olympics. Nigeria wants to win World Cup suddenly. You just bring people together. And then some people will put their energy and their blood pressure on a, on a team that was just... And you are going to meet people who have been praying together for the past 10, 15 years. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So um, it's very important. 
uh, that we introduce our children to God early in life. Let me emphasize this one very, very importantly. It is very important that you introduce your children early to God. Hmm. Because Jesus said that the children of this world are smarter than the children of light. Early introduction to children, I mean children to God, can be a make or break thing. I'm telling you. And I give you examples. I give you examples. You raise children, you don't rear children. You are intentional about raising men and women. It's not something that just happened by chance. It's something that is done intentionally. And I can show you in scriptures how raising some guys, dedication to some guys produce extraordinary results in their life. A classic example is David and Solomon. Solomon was intentionally raised for kingship because God had told David that Solomon will be the next king. So there was an unusual preparation to get him ready for that assignment. He had senior brothers, older brothers, who qualify okay, as, as kings, but they were not chosen. So the one that he knew God chose was the one they gave attention to. You are not surprised that the firstborn, how many people know that the firstborn of David was the one who raped his sister? Who was the firstborn? He was the one who raped. He, it just gives you an idea that this guy has no sense of destiny, no sense of purpose. It's the same thing with um, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, who raped his father's concubine. He raped, just in case you don't know, Master Foster. So we early introduction to God is a critical part of this equation because your children are going to come in contact with children who have no direction, who are waiting vessels for forces of life or who are seeing some experiences in life who have abducted them and they will impact or influence our children. You know, they always say that it's always the bad, bad one that corrupts the good one. Because bad is natural. The good has to be deliberate. A child is not automatically good. You know, there's a default setting in everything. I mean, you know, there's a default setting. The default setting is, is follow come. This is how it comes. And the default setting of a child is not good. Because the Bible says that there is a madness that is in the heart of child. What did he say would drive it away? That's the default. That's the default. So spare the rod. It's spoiling a child, number one. Uh, because it's not all children that you speak to. You speak to some, you beat some. Motiba. Let me show you something. Genesis chapter 35. Our time is gone. Let me, let me, Genesis chapter 5, I read from verse 1 to 5. 1 to 4, from Amplified Classic. Genesis chapter 35. And God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Who is Jacob? The grandson of Abraham. The one who carried Abraham's blessing. The one who has been having encounters with God all his life. He's the one who carries the Abrahamic covenant. God said to Abraham, I mean, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar to God who appeared to you in a distinct manifestation when you fled from the presence of Esau, your brother. Remember, that the man has always been fledging. <laughs> fledging. <laughs> then Jacob said to his household, Who is his household? His wife and children. Am I correct? He said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the images of strange gods that you have among you and purify yourself and change into fresh garments. Verse 3. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar to God who answered me, introducing his God now to them in the day of my distress and was with me wherever I went. Verse 4, so they, both young men and women, gave to Jacob all the strange gods 
they had and their earrings, which were won as charms. Jacob's sons, Jacob's children, they had what? Ifukpa, Onde, Tubetu, and the rings. They had them. I have checked through scriptures. There was nowhere where Jacob sat his children down and taught them the way of the Lord. None. So it looks like Je Joseph stumbled on it himself. Because he was different. You know, you give back to a child and that child is just different. He was different. And the Bible says he will always bring the bad report of his brothers. Jacob was too busy with the women. He had four. He didn't have time to raise his children. So it's not surprising that they had gods, strange gods and lucky charms that they had. And then Jacob buried and hid them under the oak near Shechem. Very important. So if we didn't have the understanding, the introduction of early, you know, access to God, um, you don't make that mistake. Some of us, it is that early introduction to God that is helping us today. I'm telling you. And guess what? These children are going to deal with more complicated things. The problem they are going to deal with, they have not been manufactured. They are still in the incubation now. If they don't have a wrong, strong standing with God. My daughters told me that most of their friends, they have no parents. So it's either a single mom or foster. I read the statistics that told me the idea of the foster parenting in America. It is crazy. What does foster mean? You are not raised by your own parents. So there's a system that gives them opportunity to take a child to another family to be raised. And you are saying they will have one of the highest crime rates, standard, guaranteed. Very important. My mom would say that what they used to train a child is not in King's way. It's not toys. It's not the collodion. It's not, I'm telling you, that's not what they used to raise a child. You sit the child down and raise your children. Please. Genesis 18, verse 19. Genesis 18, 19. This looks like God has a criteria that he used in picking transgenerational relationship and covenant. For I have, Genesis 18, 19, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do the righteousness, to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he had spoken to him. The reason why God was deliberate about Abraham is God said, I know that he was going to raise his children in my ways. Very, very important. Finally, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18. Deuteronomy 11 from verse 18. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine, God's word, in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That is the ultimate that God intend concerning his words. That this word will leave the pages of this material, this document, and enter into our hearts. That's the place of God's word. God's word is supposed to dwell in your heart, in your spirit. So he said, you shall teach them to your children. Speaking to them when you sit in your house. If you are too busy to teach the children the word of God. Ah. <laughs> hey. My daughter told me of a boy. I, I told the story before. In their class. Who eventually killed the mom. Killed the dad. No, killed the mom. Killed the brother. Killed the grandma. It was a boy in their class. They took him to grandma. When he was misbehaving. They couldn't raise him. He had become wayward. And then he oppresses them. He bullies people in school. So he already has the trait. So when they took him to grandma, they, I don't know what the plan was. When he came back from grandma, only God knew how he got a gun. 
gone. And he killed almost all the family, including his brother. Says you shall teach them to your children. Speaking of them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall write them on the front, on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Verse 21, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heaven. Like the days of the heavens above the earth. Very, very important. I think I have overflogged that. Sit them down. I know the, there are YouTube programs that talk about teach them yourself. What you teach them stays with them for a long time. My mom will think to all of us, my siblings are here. My siblings are here in this church. And she will do quiz for us and give us money, anyone who wins. We will invite our friends to join us. We don't know what she was doing, but that was the recreation that we had then. And then she'll give us money. Anyone who wins, uh, you can cram five scriptures, you can do whatever, and then she'll give us money. So, so we, we had something, you know, that we're looking after. Very, very important. Raise, let's raise our kids. It's very, very important. Very, very important. The next question, please explain this building relationship and fellowship with God. <laughs> I do understand it very well. <laughs> okay. And so, of course, we'll talk about building relationship and work with God. And um, it's also possible that one will just assume that people understand it. First of all, I wrote here, what, who do you want to build relationship with? God. Abi? And God is not physical. God is the spirit. So what means is that you will connect with God through the spirit. That's the first thing. If you don't know how to connect with him, then there's a big issue. God is a spirit. The Bible calls him the father of our spirits. Okay? So God is a spirit. And the Bible says that you must first believe that God exists and that he diligently reward those who come to him, those who seek him. So when you seek him, guarantee, there's a guarantee that you're going to get something okay, from your work with God. I've told you before, God is not something that you find by the wayside. It's a deliberate, you have to look for. You have to look for him. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't meet Dangote on the road. Am I correct? You don't meet the president on the road. You look for ways to get their attention, to connect with them. And we're talking of the one who created the president and created the kings and the billionaires. Very, very important. You understand that. Okay? So, so what it means is that a relationship will be built with him at a spiritual level, okay? Um, so how do you know more about this God? The easiest way to know more about God is in the scriptures because he is the author of the Bible. Let me explain that. The Bible was written by men who were inspired. So the real source, the real inspiration is God. I came up with a philosophy during the week. When, when the election results were announced. And, you know, um, one of the candidates gave a press conference and there was a quote, Abi, <laughs> that became, I told my wife when I had that thing, I knew this quote. I said, this quote is going viral. This quote is going viral. Uh, if you must be addressed at the excellency. Abi, then the way by which you enter. Must be excellent. It was very powerful and apt. I came up with a philosophy and a quote, and I said, You can be temporarily selfless so that you can be ultimately selfish. Do you understand that? I can be doing a lot of crazy things for you. I'll do everything and kill myself. There's something I'm looking for so that I'm be ultimately selfish. And that's how somebody won the election. Simple philosophy. It can be temporarily selfless so that it can be ultimately selfish. So the knowledge of God is in his word. 
There's nothing wrong with prayers. Prayer is actually supposed to be communication. I wrote something about prayers, but before I talk about prayers. Um, so, the knowledge of God is in God's word. Okay? Spend time in the word. When you are reading God's word, you are actually rubbing mind with the author of the word. That's God that you are rubbing mind with. Somebody listening to me. The Bible says that our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's, that's what it means. So, um, the more you read about the word, the more God opens his word to you. And that's very, very uh, important. So, you begin to gain access into the mind of the Father. That's how we build relationship. Just in case somebody... I remember I said it in one of my messages. That to know the mind of William Shakespeare and Isaac Newton and Faraday and Albert Einstein and all those powerful guys you interact with their documents and their materials. Am I correct? <laughs> and that's how. If you want to interact with someone, they, those guys are dead now. You can see them, but you can interact with their mind when you read their books and the documents that they have provided. It's the same thing. To enter into that realm with God, what happened is that you, you read more of God's word. Let me, let me explain from this dimension. Do you have fellowship with a child? Or you play with a child? Do you have fellowship with a child or you play with a child? You play with a child. You don't have fellowship with a child. You have fellowship with someone who is your, your level. And one of the problems also in marriage is that a husband finds out that he's at a level below his, I mean, above his wife. Or the wife finds out that she's operating at a level above her husband. Once there is heavy duty disparity at the frequency in which you're operating, there's going to be issues. So you don't fellowship with a child. You play with a child. But... When you recognize that this child is exceptionally brilliant. Remember Jesus at 12. Entered into the uh, uh, temple. And was having conversation with the teachers of the law. What were they doing with him? It was not play. Oh. That was not play. <laughs> he was doing what? He was fellowship. They were having serious conversation. When you notice a child have the capacity to operate at that level. You don't play with that child. You interact with that child is what we do when we operate in the spirit. You are not ordinary anymore. You are no more a child. Your spirit is elevated and then you, are, you can connect at the spirit level. Then God can have conversations with you. Is somebody listening to me? Abraham prayed. Abraham prayed. But Abraham also had conversations with God. Remember when he was negotiating for the deliverance of Sodom and Gomorrah. That, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So, um, I understand the place of prayer. But prayer and this, what I'm talking about, they are not the same. <laughs> Our definition of prayer needs to also change. Let me see. Let me show you something I wrote down here. Prayer is an invocation or an act that seeks to activate a rapport with an object of worship or deity through deliberate communication. You are seeking to have a rapport. Rapport means that we can have conversation. Okay, we can get familiar. That's what prayer is. Not, Lord, do this. Lord, do this. The way we have defined prayers. So Abraham prayed. In fact, you will see most of his prayer were not like we are praying. And because if, if you ask me, very easy template and example that we can follow in the Bible. We can follow some of them in the Old Testament. Check how Abraham prayed. He's not killing his enemy. He's not doing this. He's not, so you see, simple, beautiful conversation that he was having. He said to God, he said, God, you seen that you have refused to give me a child. Well, what can you give me? And that is prayer. <laughs> Just imagine that kind of conversation. He said, please, bless, bless, bless Ishmael. God said, no. He's not the one. I will bless him, but not the one. Say, ah, he said that Ishmael will just stand before you. In fact, at some point he was saying that, ah, she, you, you've promised me this thing for so many years. If it's not going to happen, is it this Eliezer who will take over? I'm talking of the dimension. See, you cannot be in that dimension and you have needs. You can't be in that dimension and you have needs.
So Abraham prayed. Abraham worshipped. But Abraham had conversations. And if you look through scriptures, I want us to always follow the template of scriptures. If we will not see other physical examples. Very, very important. Because it's... Nigerian billionaires don't write books for us to read so that we can take lessons from the experiences. How many billionaire books have you seen, Nigerian billionaires? We don't write books because for so many of them, it's very difficult for them to document how they succeeded. Quite a lot of them, government contract, government favors. And it cannot help a man who is starting from scratch. Yesterday I was having a conversation with a lady and she said she started from scratch. She runs a fashion house. And she said she started. So I said, what happened to mentoring? Why didn't you attach yourself to a mentor? She said she was actually a lawyer. I mean, she's actually a lawyer. She said she, she just stumbled on it and she was passionate about it. I said, you should have gone to invest. Because it is investment to learn from someone who is doing it or has done it before. So because all the books that I have read, I don't know how many people have read more than me, all the books I've read on Bologna on how to succeed, we started with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, good to great, um, tough, tough time, don't last, tough people, oh, Napoleon Hill, um, um, all the books, the green can grow rich and think I'm stupid, and all, all the, <laughs> who moved my cheese, all of them, have you noticed, they're foreign books. So it's either they don't think we value information, or they don't even think it is necessary. I said it. There's a man I'm looking for. If he writes a book, I don't know, there are people here. How many people here? Um, Dan Kote say, I want to have lunch with someone. My ticket is five million. If you have the money, how many people will uh, go for that, for that dinner or for that lunch? There are people here who go. I'm telling you that somebody say, it's my lunch. Uh, let's, let's have lunch. Because I have done it before. I have volunteered lunch in a top class hotel because I wanted to speak with someone. I know the person will not come if I don't introduce food. <laughs> These are the secrets that I'm sharing with you. You want to have a conversation with her? You say it's not enough time. Not say, sir, look for top best class hotel that is close to his office. Can we have lunch in your lunch? Not a bad idea. Lunch. It's not the food. It's what you want to get from them. And that's very, very important. So that's where the issue is. Um, interaction. Interaction and conversation with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. David had conversation. Moses had conversation. You will never see there where they did all those prayers. The reason why I use the book example is because if... If the fathers of faith would document some of their journeys, how they do it, it will help us significantly. Um, I have read a lot of Kenny, Kenny, um, Kenneth Egan's books, uh -huh. and those books have helped a large chunk of fathers of faith. I mean, a large chunk of the fathers of faith. Kenneth has gone down to be with the Lord, but the things that he documented are still here with us. Anyone who wants to start, you want to start a powerful relationship with God, these are the books I will first recommend. All these books. I had all, almost all the books. Very important. Uh, so if you're building a relationship with someone, you have to be deliberate, okay? Um, you have to be intentional. So in summary, walk by faith, okay? Spend focused time with God and then engage in intentional actions that is consistent with your faith. That is how to build a relationship with God. Very, very important. I just tried to break it down for someone so that it would be a lot easier for you. Somebody asked, should Christians take a loan to give in church? No. Don't take a loan. Uh -huh. Don't take a loan. And because you were saying, ah, because in some churches they will force you to, they, they will make it look as if angels will cut you into pieces if you don't go and take a loan. No. And again, I want you to do the correction. You don't give to church. You give to who? You don't give to church. You give to God. If you give to church, it's going to limit your blessings. 
You actually give to God, and God can be represented by anything. Let me show you. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, I read from verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Who requested for the offering? It was God who requested for the offering. And who did he speak through? Moses is servant. The reason why we're asking for church projects is because of the necessity for project. Once our project is finished, nobody bothers anybody about money. It's whatever you give that the church spends. It's as simple as that. The children of Israel, God asked them to go and collect gifts from Egyptians. Remember, before they left Egypt, he said, ask for anything. He said, I have given you favor with them. And the Bible said that they went to the Egyptians and took everything. The Bible said they plundered Egypt. After all, they are the ones who have been working for 400 years. So God gave them favor. So if you took anything or you got something from them and assumed that it was your own, you were stupid. It was not yours. It was grace and favor. Because God later requested for it here. He said, tell them that they should bring me an offering from everyone who gives with what? That's all. Who gives willingly from the heart, you shall take my offering. Don't, when the person doesn't give, don't take. Verse 3. And this is the offering that you shall take. God even specified what you should collect. This is the kind of offering that you, they should give me. Don't just give me anything. It's God we are talking about. <laughs> he said, this is the offering they should give me. And then he listed all of them. And then what is it for? Verse 8. All the offering that he collected. What is it for? Verse 8. Oin stones and stones to be set in the ephod. Ephod is the, is the cloth that the priest will wear. And the breastplates. And let them make me a... That's the purpose of the offering. It's not just to collect money. He was meant for something. For the sanctuary. Okay? That we're going to build. Okay? Just like we're talking about the project. It's just for this particular thing. And then the clothes that the priest will wear. Don't take a loan. A loan is the money you haven't earned. And you can't give what you don't earn. What you have not earned to God. No Christian should be forced to give. None. David said, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. David said, I will not give to God that which will not cost me something. And it's because they know that people are, people are stingy. That's why we look to wine you. Abi, you then wine me, 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 me. We wine you and wine you and wine you to bring money to God. <laughs> you think I don't know the song, have you? Ah, so let me just share a few minutes. Um, can you share some of your secrets that you talked about the other time with us? Okay, so I listed some here. Number one, love God and love people genuinely. Love God and love people genuinely. Uh, I, I lost a friend um, some three, four, five days ago, on the first, precisely. And I only got to know about it yesterday. And he was a dear friend. And honestly, I cried. My wife was the one consoling me. I, I broke down. I wept. Okay? Um, and I said, one of the things that, you know, one of the things that, that triggered my, my emotion, because he's a big boy, he owns, he's, a big, he's a big guy. One of the things that triggered my emotion was the fact that I said to my wife, I said, and I love this guy genuinely. You know? And I, I broke down. I cried. Um, so love for people uh, is one of the qualifications of a pastor or a minister. If God is going to use you, you must have compassion and love for people. It's very, very important. So you love God, you love people genuinely. Then I never show up before greatness without a gift. I never show up before greatness without a gift. Yeah, we say he's a pastor. I try as much as possible, even as a pastor, to, be, to give gifts. Maybe I should just share some. I have gone to greet a billionaire before. I could not, I couldn't give him money. I went and asked my wife to buy Benue State yam, the one they use for wedding. Big, big yams. That was what I used to embarrass him. He said, he said no one has brought me this kind of gift before. He touched something in his heart. Very, very important. Never show up before greatness 
without a gift. There are fathers of faith that have gone to, I carry a seed. My senior colleague, I go there with a seed. I never show up before greatness without a seed. That's number two. Then I cast my bread upon many waters. The Bible says, cast your bread upon many waters. It said, after many days, you will find it. So my bread could be my energy, my investment, my resources. I try as much as possible to invest in as many people as I have opportunity to. Very, very important. Then I am not attached to anything in life. I have no attachment to anything in life. This church today, if God says, pack your load, anoint Jehu, sorry. <laughs> you know when he told Elijah, Elijah he said anoint, um, um, who was the first one? Um, as a hell, <laughs> as a hell, anoint him as king over Syria. And he said, Jehu as king over uh, is it Judah or Israel? And then El Elisha as the next prophet after you. And what happened? He just did that, and that was the end of his ministry. If God said, Tunde, pack your load, anoint um, Sister Tulu <laughs> as the next bishop of White Tulip. That's all. I'm gone. No attachment to anything. And please don't have any attachment to anything like Don't. Don't. You know, I drive a Mercedes-Benz. Up to now, I have not changed the name. Because I'm asking, Lord, should I change this name to me? I have not had, and that's why I'm not. If you ask me to sell the car, I sell it tomorrow. Are you listening to me? I'm telling you principles that work in life. Once I hear an instruction, I do it. And that's how you qualify for God's attention. Remember, he said... I have been looking for a king for Israel. I told you before, I don't know if I'm Saul was not God's choice for Israel. God was not ready to give them a king. They made a demand. They put pressure on God. And God had to, had to give them someone. But after he anointed Saul, he started looking for a proper king. That was why he said, I have found a man after my heart. This one was supposed to be temporary Philly. May you not be a temporary Philly. You know, that is a blessing that God gives. And uh, you know, it's a temporary thing. It's not permanent. The God is still looking for. When he finds, he said to Saul, I mean to Samuel, he said, stop praying for him. I have rejected him. I have found. It's because you have not found. Uh -huh. Your landlord is doing shakara because you have not found another house. When you find another house, you are gone. The brother is toasting you. you are doing, it's because he has not found when he finds he's gone. <laughs> so don't have attachment to anything. And because it makes it difficult for you to be able to give. Okay? I want to give your time, give your attention, give everything that God wants you to give. Then nothing you do to me means anything until I personally ascribe meaning to it. That's another philosophy I work with. Whatever you do to me, it means nothing until I sit down and reflect and reflect and begin to attach meaning to it. That's when it makes a meaning. You can abuse me and it may not mean anything. The day I sit down and think, ah, kill all my Esau, that's the day I begin to give meaning to it. In the interim, I have no connection with it. Very, very important. And then, um, I believe in people. I believe in people. I believe in people a lot. I believe that if we train people and prepare them, they can be anything. They can be anything. We can train them to be good. We can train them to, to be badder. Sorry, to be baddest. Very important. I have so many questions. But this one, let me just end it with this last one. Let's take this last one. Why was God so angry with Moses um, that he didn't allow him to enter the promised land? What is the place of emotion in the work with God? Whoa! This one is a bit... So why did God not allow Moses to enter the promised land? Um, it was a small experience. I don't know how many people remember. Let me first try to explain who Moses is. See, this one is very important because it's, it's very, very critical to leadership and your relationship. God's Bible gave some very sterling you know, qualities of Moses. Number one, Numbers chapter 12, verse 13, chapter 3. 12, 3. Numbers 12, verse 3. Bible said that it was the meekest now, the man Moses was very humble, more than all.
all men who were on the face of the earth. That is a sterling quality of a man. They said it was that Ommu. God saw it, God recognized it. As at that time, none on the face of the earth was as humble as who? As Moses. Deuteronomy 34, 10. Deuteronomy 34, verse 10. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet in the class of Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. That is the staggering, you know, quality of Moses. Verse 12 of that same chapter 34. And by all that, and by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So that gives you an idea of what Moses was and the level in which he operated. So it looks like it was leadership that altered Moses. Remember, I was leading a generation of slaves who were super stubborn. So somewhere along the line, they all had him from inside. And it's the reason why he didn't enter the promised land. Let me show you something. Numbers chapter 20, from verse 2. Numbers 20 from verse 2. Now, there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses. There was no water. Ah, uh, um, Esa, there's no water. Um, is there anything you can do? No. They contended. See, hear what they said. If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Go on. Why have you brought up <laughs> the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is it not a place of grain and figs and vines or promulgate? No. Is there any water to drink? Go on. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And they fell on their face and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then, the Moses spoke, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron. Gather the congregations together. Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield its water. First, you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animal. So Moses took the rod from the presence of the Lord. God had given him instruction as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and said to them, Here now, you rebels! Must we bring water for you out of this rock? What now happened? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water eventually came out abundantly and the congregation and the animals drank water. The miracle happened, but something had happened. Then the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in Mount Or, by the border of the land of Edom, say, Aaron shall be gathered to his people for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the children of Israel. Because you, what did you say there? Against me. Against my, at the water of Meribah. When you're working with God, be careful. There is the place of emotion. We are emotional beings. But when it comes to your work with God, be careful. You cannot transfer emotions in the discharge of God's instruction. You saw what they said. They said all kinds of things. Just like they said to a pastor or they said to a leader. And the man got so angry. He had forgotten the instruction. So he struck the rod. They said, speak. He struck the rod twice. Jesus was supposed to be struck once. He struck him twice. And God said, oh, you didn't honor me before these people. Kai, you are not going to enter the promised land. And that was what happened. He said, your brother will die before you. Right there. And then you too, yeah. So where's the place of emotions? Hmm. When you're working with God, suspend your emotions. Especially when you're carrying out the discharge of God's responsibility. Emotion is natural. It is flesh. Flesh does not please God. That's why the Bible says we should walk in the spirit. He said we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
Remember, the one we're talking about is a spirit. He's the father of our spirit. So be sensitive when you're working with God, when you're giving instruction to God. Some pastors have cursed people out of anger. They have cursed people from the pulpit. Several years ago, I showed you from the pulpit. I mean, from where do you live? I mean, um, when we're at, um, I don't know, I call it a pastor who said, if you carry my blessing after I'm laboring over you, and you carry my blessing to another church, this is what will happen to you. How many people remember that video? He cast from the pulpit that me, I'm laboring over you. God now bless you. You now take my blessing to another church. I'm pronounced, made pronouncement from the pulpit. Yeah, it can be very emotional, but it's not, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. Very dangerous thing to do. So that was what happened to Moses. So leadership changed him. And then he brought out what I call temper and anger in him. Remember that Moses also killed someone before. So it looks like that thing has been there before. Maybe that was what humbled him. So um, let, let's be careful. You don't say things that you don't mean if you're a child of God. The Bible says the power of life and death is in the power of the tongue. Whatever you say consistently out of anger, the enemy can use it against you they can actually come to pass. Is it proverb that say you are not even sure what angel is passing? And they say, this is what they said. And then they put a stamp and a seal on it. Very, very careful. Now, um, we are spiritual beings. When the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, sometimes the, people struggle with how to give it expression. That's why when the Holy Spirit comes upon someone, they are scattering everywhere. Okay, it's because they are not too sure how to give expression. Remember, when the power came upon the disciples in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, remember that, I think it's in John chapter 20, they had already received the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus appeared before them. Okay, um, is it John chapter 20? Uh, John chapter 20 from verse 21. So Jesus said to them, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed upon them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. That was when they became born again, the disciples. So they had already received the, the, the Holy Spirit. Now, what happened in Acts 1.8 is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the activation of power in them. And Act 1.8 explained the purpose of the activation of the Holy Spirit. Everyone who becomes born again already received the baptism, of, I mean, received the Holy Spirit. What we are now waiting for is the manifestation. And that manifestation is for a purpose. Baptism for, of the Holy Spirit is not qualification to go to heaven. No. Receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Confess your sin. Then he said you have eternal life. The eternal life is the spirit. So when you came born again, the Holy Spirit was given to you. But if you don't get any Holy Ghost baptism after that, you already have the Holy Spirit. The baptism is the empowerment. And the empowerment is not for nothing. It's for a purpose. Is somebody listening to me? So when Jesus breathed upon them, they received the power of the Holy Spirit already. They received the Spirit. He was Jesus. He didn't even say it. The Bible says he breathed upon them and then said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they already had the spirit. So it was in Acts chapter 2 when he said, go and wait until you receive power. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit baptism is for power. So when people receive the baptism, sometimes they struggle on how to give expression. That's why they scatter everywhere. Okay? Mm -mm. The Holy Spirit is not the author of confusion. And that's why we just need to learn to know how to, to manage our emotions, okay, when we're in this presence. Sometimes you're in the presence of God and some people will cry. Am I correct? Some people will cry. Some people will shout. They, so it's also need to need, know how to, how to learn how to. Sometimes I'm receiving something and then somebody calls me or someone distracts me. I remember listening to a pastor, uh, one of the fathers of faith that I respect a lot. He said he... He was in a meeting, he was in a fellowship with God, and he said, God started talking to him. And he said, Father, he said, he said, Lord, can I take my writing material? He said he asked because he knew that the ones is distracted. He may not get the flu. He said the Holy that Jesus said to him, get the material. He said, when he came back, he just speak from there. That's a powerful one for me. 
he took permission. So we, because most of them, when we show up in the presence, we don't, we don't have interest. We just want to pray. You should always get your writing materials ready so that you can document the things that he says to you. If Moses didn't document them, we would not have something that we read today. Is somebody listening to me? Very, very important. Very, very important. Let me end it with Psalm, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So that we can understand the principles, how things work in the house of God. Now, is it then, brother, whenever you come together in a fellowship, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. This is the standard for the meeting of God. That's what I've told you before. We don't come here and then we are winding you to praise God. He said we should come. Everyone already activated. In other words, you already have your own relationship. You are, you are moving in your spirit already. So when we now congregate, iron sharpens iron. Fire sparks. There is heavy duty power, you know, make, made available in that meeting. Then he now said, if anyone speaks in the tongue, let there be two or the most, three, each in turn. You cannot be prophesying. Somebody saying something here. Another person saying something here. He said, no, take it in turn. When this person finish, this person can now continue. If you're speaking in tongues and nobody understands, he said, keep quiet. Because your spirit is subject to you. You can control it. How was the meeting once? And the, father, the pastor said that I, I want to say, everybody, people are grumbling. It was a wedding. You were supposed to preach for 15 minutes. And you are preaching 30 minutes. And people are already grumbling. And you are saying that this thing that God asked me to say, I must say it. If you like grumble. He was telling us grumble. <laughs> and I was in that meeting. And inside of me, I was saying, is this scriptural? Daddy, shut up. It's okay. We didn't come here to hear message. We came here to do wedding. We want to eat rice. He said, I will finish what God asked me. And the people were grumbling. And instead of him to stop, he not only saying that the spirit is not subject to him. Are you listening to me? It's not scriptural. It's not scriptural. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You can decide whether you want to continue to flow or you can say, okay, I will stop here. They will not say until God, until God, until God release me. It's not true. And let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. If you are speaking language, nobody understands you. He says, make sure no, keep quiet. And let him speak to himself. And to who? And to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the other judge. How are we judging prophecies? Or we think we don't qualify to judge? Are you reading your Bible? Because that's what scripture says. When the word is coming out, I'm judging in my spirit whether it's consistent with scriptures. Whether my spirit agrees or not. Scripture gave patterns on what a prophecy should do. If the prophecy is not fulfilling them, I shut it out instantly. It's trash. And let the others judge. But if anything is revealed by another who sit by, let the first keep silent. Verse 31. For you shall, you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets a subject, the prophet. I'll pause there. Our job is to point you to Christ. Help you to develop a relationship with the Father. I don't want to be intermediary between you and God. I will be breaking scriptures. I will not be fulfilling the purpose and the counsel of God. And that was the problem of Saul. There are so many souls in church. It's always a prophet. It's always a prophet. When Saul died, he couldn't hear God. He now needed to consult the witch of Endor. The one who, oh my God, who had been a relationship with God over time, ended up consulting witches. I don't know, but I'm sure you know that lots of Christians whose ending was fatally bad because they couldn't build their work with the Father. I pray that you will finish well. The Lord will speak to you. Amen. You will always know what to do part time. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Come by our heads as we pray. Talk to God this morning. 
Experiencing God is not the entitlement of pastors and prophets. It's the entitlement of every child of God. You have an anointing in you. You don't need anyone to teach you the anointing. Now you can come to church. Yes, we can teach you how to use it. But he said, when it comes to this issue, he said, you carry it yourself. Being born again is the regeneration of our human spirit. And I know that the things that God can do, I can do it because of the spirit of God that is inside of me. I have the nature of God in me, so I can do all things. You have access to God. God can show you things that can happen in 10, 15 years. God can give you revelation about people. God can reveal revelations about nations. God can give revelations about generations. It's not the entitlement of pastors anymore.